Hello, and a very warm welcome to another session of The Change Exchange. My guest today, Tabiso Tema, better known as Titi, the uh, host of the afternoon drive show on uh, Power FM, and also editor of Destiny Man. That's a full schedule. Hmm? <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> It is extremely, it is a full schedule, but uh, it's exciting at the same time, you know. I, um, I, I just wish it had come when I was a lot younger and a lot more energetic, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> nonetheless, it's a, it's a wonderful mm. opportunity to have, to be able to juggle um, all the things that I'm doing as well. Let's go back to the beginning. Um, you grew up in Attridgeville, but then with the school's unrest, I think, your parents sent you to your grandparents in Mavaking. Yes, I was... How did that change? I mean, it's a, it's a completely different world. If you look back to it now, what do you think, what difference did it make? You know, um, yeah, so I was born and, uh, in Attridgeville and uh, lived my early years uh, there in, in, in Attridgeville and then until, as you say, uh, got around the 76 uh, uprisings began and it uh, obviously spread from Soweto, it spread nationwide mm -hmm. and obviously it's something that concerned my, my mother at the time um, because my father died when I was only 13 months old so I was raised by my mother. So, and at the time, she was also um, thinking of uh, furthering her studies. In fact, she was about to further her studies as well. So then, uh, and of course, um, we was in, was in a fortunate position that my grandparents um, were available and uh, they could uh, help out and take the responsibility of uh, taking care of me. So I was, yeah, at the age of five, more or less, I went to go live with my, with my grandparents. It was... Um, you know, at the time, we didn't really, really didn't think much of it, or, or, or I didn't, yeah. Um, I Did just, you spend your whole school career there? So my early years, my would have been what was then uh, sub A, sub B, yes. and then uh, when I got to, when I got, when I reached standard one, then I moved back in with my mother, oh. and that's when we moved to Mafi Gang. Um, so, but while I, yeah, so when I, the early years when I started school, I was with my grandparents and I lived with them all the time. She would come and visit, uh, when she was in the in the country, um, she went to study in the UK, and then when she would come and visit, I would remember the visits would always be horrible because she would leave, yes, and I would be in tears, oh, yes, and I because I couldn't understand why I couldn't go with her, you know. Um, so, but at the time, I didn't think about what kind of impact that would be having on me. I'm still not sure that uh, I know what impact it had on me. I often compare it to my my own children now and look at what would happen, what impact it would have on them if I had to ship them off to go and live with my, with my mother now. And I just cannot see how that would work. Where does she yeah. live now? My mother lives in Johannesburg as well. Oh. So um, they visit her occasionally, yeah. but it's always like overnight. Yeah. So um, whenever we would, it's, uh, we haven't had an occasion actually where they've spent more than like a night with her. But now imagine if you had to live with her. Mm -hmm. I cannot even imagine what that would do to them. I don't think they could handle it. Mm. But uh, for me, it was just one of those things. My grandparents were like my, my parents mm. because my cousins and I all would spend our holidays together with my grandparents. So it didn't feel like a major adjustment. Yeah, Upheaval. Not mm. at all. No. And then after school, where did you go? After school, I had a year as an exchange student. And um, I, studied, uh, I went to Australia. Which and uh, Australia was actually probably my third, or oh, yeah, it was my third choice, I think, of the country that I wanted to visit. But the other two were all countries that were um, English speaking, mm -hmm. and uh, I because I just felt like, oh, this is going to be the first time I'm out of the country, I don't want to go to a place where I don't even know the language. Something that I've lived to regret. I wish I'd gone to a place where I was going to learn and pick up a new language because I actually have a passion. I love languages and I would have I wished like I had done it. But yeah, so I went to Australia because I knew a little bit, of, I knew quite a bit about uh, the country. I had an aunt who had uh, moved to Australia in the 80s. Uh, um, she went into exile into Botswana and Botswana became increasingly unsafe, so she moved to uh, Australia. So I knew a bit about the country, so I thought, no, nah, that won't be too big an adjustment. And uh, yeah, so that's what I did. Uh, and, and when uh, you came back, university? Yes, when I came back, I went to UCT for a year, uh, partied hard for a good <laughs> year, and made a complete balls up of the studies. <laughs> um, and then uh, I came back to Johannesburg, and uh, 
um, that registered with UNISA, studied uh, with UNISA, did law for uh, how many years? Say two years. And then when I was supposed to go into my third year, I thought, screw this. <laughs> I can't do this anymore. And uh, But because originally my passion, what I really wanted to do was get into to film, making films and that, get, get that kind of thing. But there were no opportunities. There was only one university that I can recall at the time that was uh, that offered um, film. And that was uh, tax. Um, they didn't admit black students at the time. So it wasn't an option. Apart from that, my mother wasn't hearing of it. It's like, what are, what are you talking about? What is that? It's not even a career. So, uh, but that was really what I wanted to do. But then I tracked myself into university, did two years of law. Actually, kind of, I enjoyed it. But uh, I just thought, like, this is not really what I want to do. And I got an opportunity to go and work in a television production company. Um, and I spent a year or so with a production company. Uh, be, um, behind the cameras, you were doing Behind the what? cameras, Sound so I would have been, uh, um, I was helping a lot with scripting. Oh. And on production, yeah, I was helping. I would do the sound, you know, um, for the cameraman. Um, a friend of mine actually wrote me in because he was doing camera work for them as well. So, yeah, and then uh, I would do voiceovers as well. And uh, I remember doing a voiceover in a particular documentary that we're doing for the script production house, a private production house. And uh, um, the owner saying to me, he'll never make a living with your voice. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> I never forget Famous that. Famous last words. Yeah, absolutely. You know, whenever you hear people say those kind of things that I was told, you'd never amounted to anything. Mm. I, always, I used to think, ah, oh, whatever, rubbish. But actually, the guy said to me, you'll never make a living with your voice. And then how did the radio opportunity arise? Always been a big sports fan. And I always wanted to get into either sports pre presenting or commentating. That was something that I wanted to do. And um, I, I had expressed that interest as well to my mother, who then uh, was invited to SAFM for an interview or something or other. And uh, she, you know, got talking to the station manager. I there have this somebody. brilliant boy. Yeah, and she's like, yeah, he loves uh, radio and wants to get into it. Uh, you know, we should give him a chance. Yeah. So from there, he says, yeah, okay, get him to do a demo tape for us or something, which I did. And uh, it took about seven months or something before they actually called me in but that was seven months of me calling once or twice every week you say uh have you considered that uh demo what do you reckon uh yeah no 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 we've heard it i just call again but this was like i later found out the guy i was talking to was just a technical guy uh. so i wasn't even i wasn't even at the stage when i was speaking to the station manager um, but Did you, yeah. Do you think it was it was what ninety six seven yes, thereabouts? Yeah. Do you think the changes in the country mm. also meant that as a black man, yes, uh, you uh, the door was a bit wider open? Absolutely, it was. It opened up an opportunity for me to go and work on an English radio station. Yes, you know and, the uh, national English the, radio station. the national English radio station and. Yes. Then, extremely intimidating environment if I, as, as I recall. What was I it like when in. you walked in? Okay, um, so obviously when I, they, they called me in, I went through training before I ever went on air and that was with a fantastic broadcaster, a lady who I'm sure you'd be familiar with, uh, Joy Cameron Dow. What a fantastic woman yes. she was. And a great, Ultimate professional. Uh, and a great teacher. Mm. And uh, yeah, I I have very fond memories of her. What and was the what one she thing she taught you? Oh, it was about uh, how to breathe from here. Yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that I remember that because it was something that took me uh, some getting used to. And she taught me how to, you know, read and write for radio. Um, you know, you're pausing in all the right places and your, your tempo is all right. And, uh, and today's children just do oh, not do it. <laughs> they just get on the radio and... Uh, yeah, I, I, I considered SAFM the University of Radio. You know, I thought I, I learned so much there. So anyway, once I'd done the training, um, then I got my opportunity to go on air, on AM Live, which was, uh, would have been, was it always called AM Live? I, 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 I would assume so. And the presenter was uh, John Mathan. Uh, I hadn't met him. That was literally the first time I saw him was when I walked into the studio to present the sports bulletin. Because, of course, the way the SCBC worked is that we, the, the station and the, the, the current affairs shows worked separate units. Yeah. So I never came across him. 
we never even had an opportunity to like yeah, you know say hello yeah. I say hello where he could like ease me into it and uh halfway through my bulletin he says to me you do realize that um, Ferrari have denied that report and I was no I didn't but you know thanks for letting me know and what a mess I I'm surprised I got through the rest of the bulletin because I was like oh my goodness I've stuffed it up. I've stuffed it up. This is it. I'm never getting back on air again. So yeah, it was an incredibly uh, intimidating Steep learning curve. Yes, and uh, yeah, <laughs> he was not accommodating at all. He wasn't about that. He was all business. Mm -hmm. And uh, having learned what I now know about him, I get that that's why he is uh, as good as he is, mm -hmm. I suppose. And uh, yeah, but uh, it was a hell of a baptism of fire. Yeah. And then uh, the television possibility. How did that happen? So after some years at SAFM, and this is the beauty of working for the SABC, is that it opens up all kinds yes. of opportunities. Mm -hmm. So um, it emerged that the SABC were looking for television, the top sport as it was known then, mm -hmm. were looking for commentators for football. And I had done a little bit of uh, commentary on, uh, uh, for SAFM um, on football. So I thought, yeah, I'll go and give it a crack. And, uh, and it turned out that there's actually, okay, great. Um, we actually want someone to do it in Setswana, which is my, my mother tongue. Oh, great. And, um, but the trick is that, well, it sounds simple, but the thing is, I had um, I mean, gotten through a point where all my working life I was working in English now. So formulating ideas and like speaking the language properly and getting all the terminology right in, my, in Setswana yes. proved to be a hell of a challenge. Yes. And I was very conscious of it because, I mean, I know that the... There are professionals who are making a living doing commentary in Setswana. And here I was busking it, you know. And I was a little bit uncomfortable about it, but I thought, geez, this is my way in. I'm not going to say no. So I did that for a few months. And then uh, the, the opportunity came to do it in English. And uh, I have been doing it since. It was 1999, I think, when I started that. And I've been... Yeah, doing it uh, in English uh, ever since. Yeah. And then with uh, the start of ETV, you mm. were part of the kind of launch team. Yeah, yeah. Uh, talk to me about that, uh, the, uh, what it is like to be, to start something new. Um, it was extremely exciting. Yes. And uh, because of, you know, uh, I'm a big news junkie and I would watch the CNN and uh, Sky, BBC and all of that. And uh, here was an opportunity to come and replicate that in South Africa. It was, and to be a part of that was very exciting for me. And uh, I, I, It was a new, the whole South African news mm. scene yeah. actually changed. Absolutely. Because Imnet existed, but it didn't broadcast news. And no, it suddenly didn't. there was an alternative news voice. That wasn't the SABC, yes. you know. And uh, I actually had left the SABC at that point. Uh, um, I stopped doing sport at SABC at that point. I actually took a pay cut to go and be a part of uh, this uh, new new project. And, Why? Uh, I just felt that it needed a change. I got tired of whining about uh, uh, some of the stuff that was going on at the SABC. And when I thought this is a great opportunity and uh, I wasn't going to pass it up. And uh, yeah, um, I didn't end up staying that long because I was soon lured back into sport uh, again on live commentary and all of that when I went back to super sport. But the uh, time that I had there was great and it was also fantastic to be part of something new. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It happened again with Power FM. It did indeed. And Power <laughs> FM is a, I mean, it's such a, how can I put it, a, a very particular beast. Mm. Uh, we had given Kari mm. on this program mm. before mm. and the whole philosophy, the whole approach, mm. that thing about we are black South Africans mm. and proud of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, tell me about that and being part of, of that energy. Yeah. So what had happened, what happened is that when I, as soon as I got wind of the fact that, uh, because they already owned another radio station in Limpopo, mm. uh, Capricorn FM, and uh, I got wind of the fact that I, I knew Given, um, and uh, so we would chat from time to time. So when I got, in fact, we were colleagues as well when he did some work at Metro FM in, uh, at the CBC. Um, and then... Uh, when I got wind of the fact that they were going to be applying for a Houting license and uh, for a talk station, I was like, guy, count me in. When yes. you do that, please, I want to be, I want a part of that. Um, and uh, I think at the time... Why? I, what, what, what drew you to, to it? I've always loved talk radio. You know, I used to, I was an avid listener of uh, 702. And I always thought that I want to do this one day. 
Uh, I'm, uh, I, I love talking to people. I love the conversation. I loved all what they were about as well, what 702 did, you know, at the time that they were doing it. I mean, they, they were pioneers and they were trailblazers. So I wanted that, and the idea to do, we have a, a 702, because 702 at the time, for the longest time, had that slant that was, uh, there was a voice of, uh, you know, speaking to white South Africa, white middle class mm -hmm. uh, South Africans. And I thought this is an exciting opportunity to now give a platform to, to, to black people. And uh, yeah, so um, to be a part of that also just excited me. And, uh, and how have you experienced it? Did you... Um, the kind of the, the picture in your mind, mm. did it come to fruition? In a lot of ways it has. In a lot of ways it has become, I mean, the, the, of course you are, you are in a very challenging environment in the sense that you're competing against a, yes. uh, a beast like a, a 702. That's because, uh, um, no doubt about it, that's who our benchmark is. That's who we have to uh, outperform. But now this is a 30-year-old radio station that you're, you're talking about. And... Uh, you know, Kaya at FM at that point had been around for, what, 15 years or so. So these are people that had been doing it, and these were our direct competitors, and, you know, to a lesser extent, your SAFMs and all of that. But um, so th those were challenging times. We had to try and find our voice. You know, I myself had to try and find my voice as a presenter. What does that uh, mean? Who am I going to be? Am I going to mimic somebody else, uh, you know, and try and sound like uh, yes. the guys uh, across town there? Or what am I going to do? And that took time. It took time, you know. Uh, for the most part, you were trying to mimic what those guys were doing because you were thinking, this this must be the way to do it. They'd been doing it for so long. And that's the only model you had. That's the only model I had. And I would say it took me a good two years to get to a point where I said, no, 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 no. I think I know what I'm about. I think I know who I am and what my strengths are. It's time to play to those strengths. And, and uh, uh, can, you, can you put it in words, how you changed? I stopped trying to Imitate replicate, anyone. yes, and replicate what I thought was a model for how talk radio should be done. And I became, uh, uh, um, I instead started to doing talk radio the way that I wanted to sound. And uh, I wanted pe people to know that the person that they were listening to on the radio was exactly the same person that they would come across if they bumped into me in the streets mm -hmm. or if they were to interact with me at an event or whatever, at a party, whatever, that I would be exactly the same person. And uh, it took me a couple of years, but I think I'm finally at that point, you know, where I, say I have found my voice. And so. talk radio is mm. so much more exposing mm. than just reporting. Mm. Because if you're, if you're a reporter mm. or a commentator, mm. uh, you can keep yourself to yourself. Mm. Talk mm. radio is not like that. How Are you yeah. happy in that? in that environment. And then also, it, it, what makes it even more challenging from that point of view is that we are now living in the era of social media. Ooh, yeah. You know, it is incredibly unforgiving. You have got a, a discerning audience, people that are, for the, I mean, I know that a lot of my listeners are much more well-educated, a lot more experienced about a lot of things than, than I am. And uh, they're not going to let you get away with uh, feeding them nonsense. Uh, you know, and that was something else that I had to learn about the fact that, you know, you have to, yeah, I mean, I, you, I know you have to, you, I, I knew that you have to prep when you go on the radio, obviously, having been a commentator. But uh, just the extent of the prep. Mm -hmm. I mean, even now, I'm not happy about the amount of work I'm able to put into, um, into my radio. And that's, a lot of it has to do with the fact that unfortunately we live in a, in a country where one doesn't always um, have the opportunity to specialize where you're allowed to. I would, if, mm. if I had it my way now, I would give up uh, the television work and the, the magazine work and focus on my radio and do just the one thing. You know, I would love to be able to do the one thing, and whether it be the radio or television, just I'm just picking radio because it just happens to be my first love. Mm. Um, but not many of us have that luxury yes. as journalists, mm -hmm. and you would know, Ruda, because uh, people have to go and become uh, PR and communications specialists or whatever practitioners in order to make a decent living. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think it's an awful pity. You, you know, I recall traveling with the SABC to Italy to cover a game there, Bafana Bafana were playing against Italy. And being at a press conference where myself and my colleague and a cameraman were the youngest people by in the room by maybe 20 years. You know, these were guys who, who knew the manager from the time when he was a player and the guy was in his 60s, you know. And I thought like, wow. Yeah, we don't have that no, yet. We don't have uh, a respect 
for that uh, that experience which we you, had it uh, in a previous in a previous generation mm. interestingly enough but we can talk about that mm. um you uh, as you now refer to it, you are also the editor of Destiny Man. Mm. Um, how did that happen? And mm. when you got the call, mm. what did you think? What did you feel? Oh, I must say, completely t surprised that actually at the time. Uh, can you call you? Can you? Can you? Me? Yes. Can you got yeah. in touch with me and uh, says, uh, "I'd like to talk to you about this opportunity. We, uh, you know, we're looking for an editor for Destiny Man." And I was like, totally flummoxed, like. Uh, really? Me? <laughs> uh, I mean, I had written stuff for magazines, contributed to magazines, but I'd never worked in a print environment before. So I thought, like, yeah, that uh, I was like well, a little bit intimidated by the prospect of editing a magazine like Ed Destiny Man. A magazine with a very strong reputation, uh, 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 well respected uh, brand. And an established yeah. team, and you have to walk in at the top. Yes, and I mean, you walk into people that probably have been working for, in print all their lives, and uh, here you are. But um, what I did have is that, uh, I mean, uh, you, you, you still had to have a sense of news, mm. uh, a sense of uh, what is relevant and what is current to people. What, and it's the what same matters. audience. Mm? Absolutely. Power FM and yes, Disney Man. indeed. So I had a sense of that. That what, mm. that's what prepared me for, for the role, you know. And uh, I figured, yeah, well, in terms of trying to um, interpret what it is that the magazine is about and what the magazine seeks to do. I certainly identify with who the magazine talks to and I can certainly be the face, if that's where the case, uh, of that magazine and uh, be the person to uh, bring bring that idea and the, uh, to life. And that what day. is the idea? You know, it's about a celebration of excellence. You know, we are, highly, we are very aspirational as a title, you know. We are not necessarily going to reflect South Africa or South African men as they are, but how they can be. And but you through you do that through celebrating those that have reached that point, you know. But you also have to interpret what is, uh, what success is about and what excellence is about because uh, um, it comes in different forms. Not everybody is going to be successful by being a successful businessman or a successful politician that the success of a sportsman is just as important and just as remarkable as that of a businessman, of a politician, of an academic, whatever your chosen field. And uh, that is what we're, we're about. Yeah. I was reading a fascinating article in the New York Times yeah. about black boys mm. in America and the lack of role models. Mm. Do you see your role mm. as that as well? I don't even think I have a choice in the matter. It is a daunting um, idea to actually uh, think about the fact that someone considers you a role model. But uh, it is a responsibility that, com that comes with uh, um, the territory and that comes with uh, the work that I do, that you have a responsibility um, um, to those that look up to you. And as you say, young black men, uh, young black boys don't have a lot of role models, particularly those who live in the townships because unfortunately what happened is that post 94 those models of success and those role models then there was a mass exodus as people mm -hmm. headed for for suburbia so that um, in life when young boys in the township now see what success is about is like driving a fancy car but what does it take to drive that fancy car the role models that they have in the townships are not necessarily the most savory characters. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a, a responsibility to try and show those young people that uh, these things can be done, you know, and that they are more positive and, of, dare I say, legal ways <laughs> to uh, achieve these material things because uh, we live in a society where success, unfortunately, is judged mm -hmm. in material terms. But that uh, it is important for them to be able to see themselves uh, uh, in us, and, and I say us and people who are in my position, who also are public figures now uh, because of the work that I do. So it's not uh, something that I set out to be, that I'm going to be a role model, but it has certainly... It comes with the territory, It comes with the territory, yeah. and I've had to embrace it and actually accept uh, that that is my responsibility, that I have to be about something bigger than myself. And uh, plans or dreams uh, mm. professionally? I would like to be like those old men that I saw in Italy. <laughs> I'd like to be able to um, retire doing what I do. Um, 
I've had a taste of management. It's not my thing. I, just, I don't really have not a desire. No, I don't <laughs> particularly like. Um, I'm, I'm much. I think I consider myself a follower. You know. And I don't even think that I, I, I do play a leadership role now. And I, but part I, of the team, not Yeah, but a, I don't consider myself a boss. I could rather consider myself a, a coach, if you like, and somebody who helps people to thrive and someone who helps uh, my team bring out the best in themselves. And I also have a, that is the approach that I take to, to management is that uh, I allow people to thrive and instead I will guide them and I will help them where I think that they're mm. going wrong. But I certainly don't bark instructions at people <laughs> and I have no desire to do that. So I would like to be able to do what I do until I'm at a stage where I don't want to do it anymore. And I say thank you very much. And I hope that um, our industry will mature enough to be able to respect the fact that uh, Mm. This is not a hobby. We're not doing this as a hobby. This is what we do. This is a craft that we take very seriously. Mm. And that uh, in as much as somebody is going to retire a teacher, I want to be able to retire as a broadcaster. As a radio man. As a radio man, <laughs> yeah. So. And uh, talk about radio people. Let's uh, uh, go to your personal life, if mm. I may. Mm -hmm. You met your wife, mm -hmm. uh, Celeste. Yes. She was working for Aris here, for the Afrikaans radio service. Yes, I bumped into in the corridors there, the, in the dungeons of the SMBC. No, I've been there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, she actually worked down the passage from where I was. She was and uh, what, what attracted you, apart from... The, uh, you know, they say love at first sight is lust with potential. Yes, so <laughs> <laughs> that's a very good way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But apart from what you saw, yeah. Apart from what I saw, obviously, once I, I got to know her, um, I came across somebody who, um, you know, was uh, actually. I mean, apart from the fact that we actually uh, got along, uh, because I suppose we do the same kind of work. The kind of it was easy to get into a conversation where. We related to one another. Share the same values? We sh indeed. That was very important. I mean, was, uh, the longer that we got to know each other and uh, I got to, uh, in the early stages of our courtship, I got to meet her father, which uh, was not part of my plan. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, she insisted. So, and my father's coming to town because uh, she's from Cape Town. So he says, my father's coming to town and uh, I'd like you to meet him. And it's like, oh my goodness, that was a worry. And uh, okay, it happened. I went along and I met the father, and he hugged me, which was like, oh my word, okay, I wasn't ready for that. So, but I'm, you know, got to know the, the father and got to realize that uh, she was raised uh, to a large extent in a similar way mm -hmm. to how I was. We saw we had a very similar outlook on the world, and our values were definitely aligned. Different yeah. cultural backgrounds, Indeed. and yet you found that you were more similar than different. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, she was raised in a colored family in, uh, in Cape Town, which is uh, very different. Uh, and uh, as I'm sure you would know that uh, um, colored South Africans and, uh, you know, especially in the Western Cape, are very different from their black counterparts in, in terms of the life that they led, you know. Um, they enjoyed certainly as much more, a, a little bit more privilege, that, 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 as much privilege as apartheid would afford you. And they were also, you know, damaged to some extent, if I can use that word, by the, the system that actually convinced them that you are actually the better blacks. <laughs> so it was a, a bit... Um, Always a challenge when I remember even when I was in Cape Town uh, that uh, trying to date uh, colored girls, it just didn't happen. They were, they were not open to it. They did not consider, it was like, no, go to your own people. They would actually say stuff like that. Sure. So there was an element of me that was very nervous about how they would receive me. Mm. Um, but uh, obviously in time, uh, I discovered through her, I would have known from her that uh, how they'd receive. So by the time I met them, I was very... Uh, sure, sure uh, <laughs> confident that uh, I would be well um, received. But yes, raised in very different worlds. Um, but uh, I mean, and uh, very, she was in a very religious family. I was in a in a very religious. I grew up in a not as religious as hers was. I used to tease her and say that yeah, your family are more Christian fundamentalists, you know, <laughs> because they've loosened up, and I'd like to take some of the credit for that. <laughs> That uh, yeah. So when we got married, 
they were like, uh, okay, that's fine, but there will be no alcohol at the at the wedding. And I was like, okay, that is going to be a problem. <laughs> because <laughs> I have drinkers in my family, you know. But eventually they came around. And mm. uh, I mean, it wasn't as if they were going to find themselves uh, in an environment that was completely alien to them because there wasn't going to have people falling about the place. <laughs> so that didn't happen. And I think um, they were that... Uh, by the time that they had to come, because, you know, we had two parts. We had the Cape Town part of the wedding, and they had to come to Johannesburg as well. By the time they came up here, you know, they were quite comfortable with the idea of being in an environment where people are drinking and all of that. Yeah. So you've been married, what, about 15 years 15 now? years, yeah. Uh, it'll be 16 years this year. And what, uh, what keeps it going? I mean, 15 years is, is quite some time. It is quite some time. <laughs> and as I've learned uh, that, uh, you know, First of all, I mean, marriage is a strong commitment. Mm. I think, uh, and then I think uh, also what my mother told me when I got married is that it was something that I realized about love is, and marriage is that love is not just an emotion. It's much more than an emotion. It's a choice. Mm. You know, it's a choice and a, and a commitment and a decision that you make. You choose to love that person that you're with. And even on the days you don't like her. Even on the days when you don't <laughs> like her. Absolutely. And that it takes work. You know, I've often used the analogy of a business arrangement, as crude as it might sound. Is that, but when you go into business with someone, you're not going to uh, call it off at the first sign of disagreement. You know, people stay in business with people that they fight with and have fierce fights with for, for many years. Yes, yeah, sometimes uh, uh, the fights become too much and they go their separate ways. But the fact is that they work at it. You know, mm -hmm. they, what brings them together um, the, or the things that bring them together um, exceed the things that mm. uh, you know set, mm. that divide them, and it's it's the same with my wife. The things. If you say work at it, what do you do mm. to to keep the connection? Communication has been very important. Uh, um, we talk about our feelings, uh, mm. not as much as personally, maybe m myself, not as much as she would like. Mm -hmm. That I tend to bottle things up. Am I, you know, she deals with things and uh, I always say, you're the fighter in this outfit, <laughs> you know. And uh, so she's, you know, she speaks her mind and uh, if something is not making her happy, she'll let it be known. And uh, the fact that we've been so open in our relationship uh, has been the most important part of communication. But it also sounds as if both of you had very good role models in your parents. Absolutely. I mean, with her, um, I looked at the way her father and mother related to one another. I didn't have that privilege that mm. she has had of uh, being uh, growing up uh, raised by uh, both parents, you know. But I see the way that her mother related to her father and the way the father treated uh, her mom. And it was something that I wanted to replicate, the way her father treated his children and uh, he was a very doting father, you know, even one of these people, these were adults uh, that we're talking about, no one kids anymore by the time I met them, but he would stay up, you know, until they came, she came home. And I was like, geez, your dad's got to chill, you're not a child anymore. But I admired the way that uh, he related to his wife and the love that he showed for his wife. And, um, and I think that it was something that my mother also picked up yes. on and he said it's very important that... Uh, you know, um, you look at the way the mother relates to the father. You, you will also know how you are expected to treat their child, and uh, yeah, that was very, very, very important. And then uh, your own children. Yeah. Can you remember the first time you held your baby? Yeah, it's uh, I can. My firstborn. I, my memories of my. F I, I, actually, I suppose I have. I was in a daze when my first child was born. You know, I've heard people say. It was the happiest day of my life when my first child was born. For me, it is a bit of a blur that day, and I was almost having an outer body experience. I didn't, I was like, It was wow. just too much. It was, it was too much. And it took me, even the emotions that were supposed to accompany that, that you're supposed to be so in love with this person, <laughs> and I didn't feel that at first, you know. Um, a newborn baby is not pretty. Yeah, <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah, but yeah, for me, it was like, all right, this person, this little person, this little being is me. Is my, I'm supposed to look after this person. So I had to grow into that one as well. You know, so I didn't experience the overwhelming emotion that people speak of when their first child, uh, when their kids are born. And it was, it was, um, 
the, the, it was a different experience because with my firstborn, I knew that it was going to be a girl because, um, you know, we were happy mm. to have the doctor tell us. But with the second one, we said, no, we'd like a surprise. We'd like not to know. So, yeah, uh, when my daughter, my second one was born as well, I was like, uh, now it was that surprise that, oh, I was so convinced it's a boy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you soon, you, you quickly get over that, you know. And how did they change you? Ah, oh, gosh. Um, I think I also had to do a lot of growing up. We had to wait a long time to have kids. I mean, we, we yes, when we first got married, we just said, no, let's give ourselves a few years um, to get to know each other better, you know, uh, before we bring in children into it. You know, you 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 have this assumption. It's complicated enough. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and then you also have this assumption or this arrogance that uh, you will have children when you, are, when you choose to have them. It doesn't work like that. Um, it's not up to you. So we went through many years where we had, uh, you know, to deal with the, uh, the challenges of uh, not uh, being able to con conceive a child, and that can be quite testing to the relationship. Um, takes can it take its toll? Um, but I'm quite grateful that we were we had to wait as long as we did because it meant that uh, we matured as a couple, we matured as individuals, and that uh, I had to grow up as well. In that, uh, you know, a couple of years into uh, after my child was born, I had to also look at. Uh, my own lifestyle and who I was. I think I mature, matured a lot later than my wife did, you know, grew into the role a lot later than she did. And then I had to make decisions about what priorities were in my life now. Um, you know, things such as friends become a lot less <laughs> important to you. Um, you become a little bit more focused from even a, a career point of view to know that now everything that you're doing is to contribute to their future. their future and uh, yeah. you know so but it's also yeah. about time priorities huh yes yes mm. that is something that i'm still grappling with today because of the work that i do that uh, i don't keep regular hours nine to five back at home where um then i spend weekends with my children and my wife i don't i haven't had that i've never really had that since i have started working so it is now it's something that i have made conscious uh, effort to try and make the time. Every spare moment that I have, I spend with my wife and children because I don't have a lot of uh, spare time. Mm. You know, mm. um, my schedule um, simply doesn't allow the, the, I said, the luxuries that everybody else has. You know, like my wife always says, when we are together as a family on a rare weekend, we're like, see, this is what normal people do. <laughs> you know, and yeah, and uh, I've come to 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 appreciate that. Uh, that you know it's something that a lot of people take for granted because it's a lot of it's something that a lot of people have you know they're with their families every weekend i have not had that luxury and uh, so it took me a while as well to realize that listen you can't now on the one saturday that you have of want to go and play golf it's yeah. just not an option or want to go and hang out with the boys but i've embraced it i'm very comfortable with it now and i wouldn't have it any other way yeah. Did he end of uh, uh, home? What is home? What is non-negotiable when you, when you, when you were looking for a home? What mm -hmm. were you looking for? A home, as in the the physical structure, yes. or are we talking about? Oh, okay. Um, for me, a garden has always been important. Oh. I always felt like whatever house I live in um, has to have a garden. I like the idea of being able to have space. You know. Um, I remember when uh, I lived or still lived with my mother. She, when she moved into a cluster house, how I, how suffocating I found it, you know, because you've got so little space and you're living one on top of the other. And uh, I always grew up in uh, in homes where we had space. When I lived mm. with my grandparents, uh, they lived in a small uh, town a township where there was lots of space. You know, yeah. we had a big yard, so. Yeah, that's always been a non-negotiable for me. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, what other things that are important to me, it's got to have a nice living area. Um, mm. The kitchen, very important. Do you cook? Yeah, I do. I do oh. from time. Not as much as I used to in the past, uh, but I like to dabble um, in, in, the, in the kitchen. Mm. Uh, I used to think I am, I'm a great cook until <laughs> MasterChef came on TV. Oh and I realized that... <laughs> 
what I'm doing is messing around. I'm boiling <laughs> eggs. I might as well just be boiling eggs compared to what people do there. So I'm definitely not on that level. I'm a, I'm a pragmatic or a practical cook. I just uh, churn out meals that uh, if we need to eat, I will put um, something together. Every now and again, I'll experiment. But I do like and what, to do it. And what makes a house a home? It's love. It's the people that occupy that house that make it a home, you know. Um, if I were going back to the same home, that the same house that I live in, if, uh, without the people in it, mm. mm -mm, it would not be... It would not be. It would not be the same. I might as well be living in a, in a, you know, in a hostel, you know. Actually, the the, the trappings that the house come with uh, would mean absolutely nothing if I didn't have my family to share it with. So that is, uh, it's the people in it. It's the love that is in a, in a home. I know I can come back for home from a, a bad day at work and know that I'm going to a place where I'm not going to be judged, uh, where it's a place of refuge. So it's a safe space for me. So it means absolutely everything to me to have um, the people that are inside of that house. We can live in a tent for all I care, yeah. but as long as I've got them. Yeah. Didi, thank you so much yeah. for spending some of your precious time with us. Thank you and very much. All of the very, very best. I hope you have a long and happy career as a radio man. Thank you so much. <laughs> and it's been an absolute pleasure. And a, a privilege to meet you as well as somebody that I grew that I've watched for so many years. Uh, you know, on the as television. long as you don't call me Tani. <laughs> I promise, I promise, I won't. And but yeah, to be able to share time and uh, with a, a professional that I respect so much, as uh, I appreciate you inviting me. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Until the next time. Goodbye.